Good morning. Good morning. Let's make sure everybody's on the same page here. It's good to see you this morning. Here at Coon Rapids United Methodist Church, I'm Pastor Jeff Utek. Within our Christian calendar, um, in our United Methodist Church, we set aside one Sunday a year to uh, read the scripture about Jesus' baptism. And we can use this as a time to renew our own baptism. And so today is our um, baptism of the Lord Sunday. And it'll be an opportunity for all of us to renew our baptism vows and to kind of reunite with God through this expression of placing water on our heads. And you can actually hear the sound of the water uh, coming from the fountain here on our altar as a reminder of the power and the force and this incredible cleansing that comes to us through our baptism. The psalmist writes in Psalm 126, the Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy. Restore us, O Lord, like streams in the desert. That's our baptism. Before we get started, I want to give you an opportunity to greet each other and to share the peace of God. So would you stand and, and do that and find somebody who might be a guest or new to you and share God's love and peace.
Would you please stand and join me in worshiping with our voices this morning, if you can? So I have a little story to tell you real quick. I know I just made you stand, sorry. but <laughs> So I, I don't know, anybody else ever experienced once you hit 40, everything just kind of starts going downhill. Lots of doctor's appointments, lots of stuff going on. But my eyes are what went started going downhill. And about four or five years ago, I started needing reading glasses. And it's only because poor Sunny was getting my music in the back of her head because I couldn't get my arms you know, close enough during choir. It was really choir. So I've been having reading glasses and they've gotten stronger and stronger and stronger over the years. And about six months ago, I realized I needed my old reading glasses for distance. And then it was this back and forth and shuffle and my poor family, I'm always like, where are my glasses and where are my purple ones and where are my teal ones? And my kids are like, they're on your head, mom. But I was really, really tired of it. So I went to the doctor and I said, what can we do? And she talked about bifocal contacts. I wasn't interested in glasses. And she said, but you know what? They're really expensive. So here's what I got for you. Monofocal contacts. Anybody ever heard of these? All right, I've got my reading prescription in my left eye, and I've got my distance prescription in my right eye, and apparently my brain is supposed to adjust. It's not happening, people. <laughs> so, and the other problem is that my contact for reading is for right here, not for right here. So I apologize for this this morning. Um, no, but here's what got me thinking, you guys. This is such... This is what happens in our life. Like for two weeks now, I have been feeling really wonky. Everything's been feeling a little bit off kilter. My depth perception is all messed up. My driving, especially at night, I got the big halo from my left eye from all the, you know, it's, that's my, it's just been wonky and off kilter and it hasn't felt right and I felt like my footing is unsure. And isn't that what happens in our life sometimes? Like really, that is what happens in our life sometimes. And I've noticed over the last couple weeks that one of my coping mechanisms is just to find something familiar. When I can't figure out how far the couch is, it's like, okay, well, I know how, where this step is, you know? I find something familiar. When I'm driving and I'm feeling like everything is wonky, I'm like, okay, I know that building, we're good, you know? It just helps make me feel better to find something familiar. And what's that something familiar you guys reach for when your life is feeling a little off kilter and wonky? Maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's your kids, maybe it's who knows, but ultimately, our God is our something that's familiar. Our God is just rock solid and right there all the time, no matter how wonky and off kilter and how bad our depth perception is. We can't figure out what's up, what's down, what's sideways, but God is right there and he's always familiar. And we're gonna sing about that today. He's indescribable, uncontainable, amazing God. Let's pray real quick before we sing, you guys. Dear Lord, no matter how off kilter we get, we so appreciate that you are there. You are our rock. You are that familiar thing that we can always, always reach for and always count on. No matter how upside down our life gets, there you are, upside down with us, just hanging in there with us. Please, Lord, always help us to remember that even when we feel like we've got nothing with us, we know that you really are there. We can reach out to you because you are indescribable. You are all powerful, you are unchangeable, and you are right there with us. Amen.
Please join me in our unison prayers in your program or on screen. Creating God, the wind of your spirit swept across the waters and the world was there. God who calls, your spirit spoke at the waters of the Jordan, naming Jesus as your child. God who blesses, you gave us your spirit in the waters of our baptism, naming us as your children and giving us an unquenchable thirst for your glory. May the waters of your grace flow through our lives and become a river of righteousness. Amen. Well, let us continue in silent prayer, focusing on this amazing God who knows us by name, calls us today by name, and invites us to renew our baptism. Let us pray in silence. Please join me in the words our Lord taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning uh, comes from Matthew's gospel. There are uh, three accounts of the baptism of Jesus. Uh, here in Matthew at chapter 3, beginning at verse 13, we'll read it to the end of the chapter, just a few verses. Uh, this brief account of Jesus meeting his cousin John, John the Baptist, in the wilderness, entering the Jordan River, receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit and the words of God, affirming his sonship. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. Now, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Well, may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thanks be to God.
Thank you, choir. All of the elements of worship this morning are pointing us in this direction about God's grace and love for each one of us. I do want to invite the children at this time to go to Kids Connections Church. Those uh, ages three through fifth grade are invited to go to the multi-purpose room. And uh, we trust and know that they will be blessed as they worship God together in their own way. Uh, just a couple of announcements to remind you that next week we start a new sermon series uh, out of the book of Colossians. And so for about uh, the next uh, maybe seven or eight weeks, uh, we'll be focusing on that. And so if you want to read along and get started for next week, uh, Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. And uh, we're going to focus on what it means to be established in faith and hope and love. So that'll be next week. And then the week after that is our annual United Methodist Women's Sunday. Uh, where our women of our church uh, will be leading our worship and uh, we have a guest speaker coming as well. That should be a very fulfilling and meaningful day. And then, my goodness, February 14th, not too far off, uh, is the beginning of the Lenten season. And so on Valentine's Day is also Ash Wednesday. But I hope you'll be able to set that Wednesday night aside uh, from 7 to 8 o'clock as we gather together uh, here uh, that evening to begin that period of time when we uh, walk with Jesus through the wilderness and on to the cross and Easter. So lots ahead for us as we worship together as the body of Christ. Today is also Human Relations Sunday. I just wanted to comment on uh, the envelope that's in your, uh, in your program. Uh, you're certainly welcome to give a special offering. Human Relations Day uh, usually is a way for the United Methodist Church to support youth and uh, ministries to troubled youth, homeless youth, uh, youth that are involved in perhaps uh, sex trafficking or drug issues or things of that sort. Uh, and so it's a special gift. It's a special way to support our United Methodist ministries in that endeavor. And those are kind of the end of our announcements today. Do fill out the green registration cards and uh, be prepared to, to pass those in along or into the offering plates uh, as we move forward in worship today. Yeah, what was that? Just an insert? Well, some of them might have envelopes, but does anybody have envelopes in your boat? Some do. Uh, so you can <laughs> maybe find somebody who has an envelope after worship, but I think we had a limited amount, so we put them in just every other or every few uh, bulletins. Some of you might remember, I think most of us here are old enough to remember those those times in, in, that we could see on TV, and in my case, I remember them more on black and white TVs. Those occasions where there was video footage of the civil, right march, civil rights marches. Back in the 1960s, I would have been an, an early teenager. And you'll remember seeing Martin Luther King. Tomorrow, I think we celebrate his birthday. You'll remember Martin Luther King, often at the front of those 
civil rights marches, how he received his share of, of those stinging, remember these high pressured water hoses? You remember that? Reverend King once remarked that he and the other marchers had what he called a common strength. And he put it this way. He said, as we went before the fire hoses, we knew we had known water before. He said, if we were Baptist or of some other denominations, we had been immersed in water. If we were Methodist or some other denominations, we had been sprinkled with water. But we all knew the water. See, you and I, we know water. All of God's children know water. We share by our faith this, this common symbol, this initiation, this, this rite of beginning the life of following Jesus, which, which is a part of this whole power of God over the deep and over the raging chaos of life. We know water. All over the world, baptism with water unites believers in Christ. And so in both our remembering and in our baptizing, we proclaim the grace of God, which identifies us and empowers us as God's very own children. Jesus' baptism. This is a kind of an interesting experience. In our scripture for this morning, John the Baptist appears it's kind of a, uh, you know, a wild kind of ragtag uh, evangelist out there in the wilderness. He had developed quite a ministry uh, along the Jordan River. He was preaching really an unyielding message of repentance. Repent, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand, he would say. And he would offer baptism to those who felt so convicted. And it would be a sign of their forgiveness and beginning of life in this kingdom. And then Jesus comes along one day in the wilderness and he requests this baptism for himself, which really kind of threw John into something of a predicament. Even John acknowledges how awkward it will be for him to baptize the very one whom he feels unworthy even to carry his sandals. Me baptize you, Jesus? It should be the other way around. John's misgivings about baptizing Jesus are noteworthy. For if, as John was proclaiming, baptism was for the forgiveness of sin. And if Jesus really was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, as John proclaimed in his gospel, then Jesus knew no sin. And technically speaking, logically speaking, why would he need baptism? So in other words, in receiving baptism, Jesus could have undermined the entire premise that he was sinless. And if he wasn't sinless, maybe, maybe he wasn't the son of God either. So you can see where, where this could be headed. But the gospel writers... The early church historians, the early theologians of the faith, all and the commentators of the day, they all went to great lengths to make sure that they communicated the truth of the matter, that the Son of God was sinless, and, and that the, the, the mother of the Son of God was indeed a virgin, and that this Messiah, this chosen one of God, would come from Nazareth. All of this just as it had been prophesied centuries earlier. And then, despite John's understandable reservations, Jesus said, it's proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. So Jesus resolved the, the tension in John's own mind. It's as if Jesus said, John, let's just do this. It's, it's the right thing to do. And with that, Jesus and John walked down the, the muddy banks of the Jordan River 
And they waded out into the water and John baptized Jesus. And then the unmistakable voice of, of God was heard. This is my son, the beloved, in whom I am well pleased. And so began the ministry of Jesus to fulfill all righteousness. But let me ask you this. What might Jesus have meant when he said to John, it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness? Because I think it means that however many questions might have been tossed around about the reason a sinless Jesus needed to baptize, I think there would have been a whole lot more questions if he had not been baptized. That if in Jesus... God had actually come to us. Remember the name that was given to him, Emmanuel, God with us. Then it was important for Jesus to stand where you and I stand. To assume his place among those who he loved. Among those he came to save. That by wading into the river himself, he was confirming our humanity and our need for forgiveness. And ultimately, he was confirming our value and demonstrating in a very real and tangible way that it really was possible for even the worst of us to be washed clean, as the choir sang, whiter than snow, by the very righteousness that he established. And so today, let me reaffirm to you the very core of the Christian faith that just as God says to Jesus, you are my son, the beloved with whom I am well pleased, so God says to the, the very same thing to you. You are loved by God. God always takes the step of grace right toward you to love you. The waters of baptism symbolize the freely given grace of God, claiming each individual in whatever condition and nourishing and washing us clean. God takes the first step. God loves us first. God brings all of us, each one of us, into this relationship with his divine self first. The gospel writer John, not the same as John the Baptist, the disciple John, makes this very same point about Jesus in his own very unique a way in his gospel in the very first chapter. For John, Jesus is full of God's glory. Jesus is full of grace and full of truth. From Jesus, we have all received grace upon grace. All this is there in that first chapter of John, setting the stage for a, a complete understanding of Jesus' life and ministry. See, Jesus is understood to be full of grace. And Jesus even points beyond himself. He says, no one has ever seen God, but God's only son, who has made him known. See, this great, gracious nature of God is revealed to us in Jesus. It is the dominant characteristic of God. For herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent us his son. In his reflecting about the work of God's grace, John Wesley, you all know who he is? The founder of our, of our Methodist church and, and, and Methodist movement. He developed what he called the scriptural way of salvation. And in this understanding... Wesley outlines a process by which God loves us. And he gives us kind of the effect that God's love has upon us. And he reminds us that grace is unmerited love. It is, it is love that you and I do not deserve. It is love freely bestowed, freely given, with no strings attached. And we don't have to do anything to earn this love, Wesley said, he had a word for this, he called it prevenient. Prevenient. 
By this term, he meant it was available to us long before we knew that it was. And that may not make sense. But God is at work exerting his grace upon every human being, even if they don't understand or recognize it. That's prevenient grace. It, it's working ahead of time. And God gives that to us. Uh, and, and it helps us become aware of God. It helps us turn our hearts to God. It's a grace that helps us receive God's love. God acts to love us before we do anything. In other words, grace and this relationship that we have with God does not begin with us. It begins with God. Nothing is original with us. God is the originator. And that's prevenient grace at work. According to Wesley, there's a second step of grace. If prevenient grace, God moving toward us, is the first step, there's another step of grace. Wesley calls it justifying grace. And this is grace that declares us forgiven. It is the love that redeems us. It is the love that reunites us to God by, by healing this broken relationship between us and God. And the break occurs because we are a people of sin. And so this, this is in the middle, this love, this justifying grace. It's in the very midst of the messiness of life. God getting into the trenches of life with us. Telling us that no matter what is going on, his love will never leave us. Justifying grace has to be received. It has to be acknowledged. It has to be um, accepted. And once it is, it assures us a holy, uh, everlasting relationship with God. Wesley then went on to say that once you have said yes to justifying grace and you've entered into that life-saving relationship with God, that there is yet a third step of grace. He says grace didn't just reach out to us. Grace didn't just reunite us with God. But God's grace strengthens us, equips us for a greater holy love. And Wesley called this sanctifying grace. He, he would call it perfect love, growing in grace, moving us on toward the perfect holiness of God himself. It is this aspect of God's grace that if we respond to it, if we say yes to it, it keeps us spiritually acting faithfully all our lives to God. Thus, God's grace is first, it's middle and it's last. It's prevenient, it's justifying, and it is sanctifying. Therefore, God's grace is all, and grace is always offered to us. See, God wants to stay connected to us. God wants the connectivity of his grace through Jesus Christ to always be available to us. And we Christians believe that in Jesus and in the Holy Spirit, God's grace is always present to us. God will forever try to connect with us. Grace is God's first step toward us. Grace is God's constant step toward us. This morning, you are offered a righteous cleansing full of grace that calls you back to who you truly are. A child of God created for love and made for joy. There's a kind of a, a story it goes about a, a type A person. You all know type A people. This is a type A aggressive businessman. And one day he sees a fisherman sitting beside his boat. And the fisherman is playing with a small child. And this, this businessman says to the fisherman, why aren't you out fishing? And he says, because I caught enough fish for the day already. 
Well, why don't you want to catch some more? Well, what would I do with them? And the businessman, being so aggressive at type A, he grows more intense in his questioning. He says, listen, you could earn more money, buy a bigger boat, catch more fish, then buy lots of boats. Eventually, you could have a whole fleet of boats, and you'd become very wealthy and happy. And the fisherman says, but then what would I do? Well, then, said the businessman, you could really enjoy life. And the fisherman looked at the businessman kind of quizzically, and he asked, what do you think I'm doing now? The baptism of Jesus is all about our dying to our self-centered, sin-centered, controlling endeavors and being resurrected into a life of righteousness, holiness, holy love, marked by grace. Marked by joy. When, when we live in the baptism of Jesus, we touch the hearts of others and we help open others to the Holy Spirit and new life in Christ. There is no greater joy in all of life than to receive and share the love of God. Do you know that joy? Baptism has been described as the Christian's ordination. The Christian's ultimate blessing and anointing. Baptism. And so during the week before his death, the leaders of the temple challenged Jesus. And they, they asked this question. They said, by what authority are you doing these things? You know, Jesus had been healing people, forgiving people. And they asked him, by what authority do you do these things? And Jesus answers with a reference to his baptism. He says, was the baptism of John from heaven or not? See, he's really saying, I do these things because I was baptized. Because I was baptized, I do these things. My friends, the love of God, can you hear it? It is poured out over us so that we can pour out that same love over others. We United Methodist pastors, uh, we are appointed by our bishops to new places of ministry. Actually, every year, it's, you know, if, if you're in the same place for many years, every year you're reappointed. But every year you get appointed by your bishop. And at the annual conference, which meets once a year here in Minnesota, we meet in St. Cloud in June. But at each annual conference session, all these pastoral appointments are read. And then the bishop fixes them. He sets them. And it's usually a statement to the effect that these are your assignments. So go do the work. There uh, was a bishop in our United Methodist Church, Bishop Edsel Ammons, uh, a great bishop, and he died on Christmas Eve at the age of 86. I think it was about four years ago now. And he was a very gifted musician. And he would fix the appointments of his clergy every year by singing at an annual conference unaccompanied these words. And I love this. Don't you hear a voice of calling? Don't you hear a voice a calling? Don't you hear a voice a calling? Oh, sinner, feed my sheep. Blessed joy for you is waiting. Blessed joy for you is waiting. Blessed joy for you is waiting. Oh, sinner, feed my sheep. You see, the first step in following Jesus is that God abundantly pours out God's grace on each one of you, in both your baptism and in the renewal of your baptism, blessed joy for you is waiting. So before you leave this room, you're invited, if you want to, to pause for a moment, to come forward, 
to touch your forehead with water and to say gratefully, I am baptized in Christ. My joy is now complete. Let's pray. God, thank you for this a gift of initiation. Today, for many of us, a reminder of who we are and whose we are. That we belong to you and, and that in Christ we are your beloved children. Made righteous and holy already through the work of Christ and his love. But we come today, Lord, uh, wishing to be renewed in this. And so bless the water. Let it be for us a great sign of your never-ending, never-failing love and grace. And make your joy complete in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to stand and, and let's sing just two times uh, this song, Spirit of the Living God. It's number 393 in your hymn books. Spirit of the living God, call the fresh Spirit of the living God, call the fresh Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me. Holy Spirit, we ask you now to come and fall afresh on the gifts that we offer because we, we give these gifts out of our baptism. Wanting to share your grace and love poured out upon others. So however you can use these gifts in the work of your church or the mission of Christ in the world, we pray you would do so and bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Our ushers will come among you to receive this morning's offerings.
Please be seated. And uh, you may turn to your uh, bulletins, or you can follow along on screen either way, whichever might be easiest for you as we uh, begin now this invitation to the renewal of our baptisms. And I do want you to know, if you've never been baptized, there might be someone or two or three who are here today, and uh, you know you were never baptized as a child or as an adult, and maybe God has called you this morning to himself in ways that you wish to be baptized and identified as a Christian. If so, uh, later on in our ceremony, if you wish to come forward uh, here uh, to, to me, I'd be more than happy to baptize you. I have a couple more questions I'd want to ask, but, uh, but all are welcome today to the waters of baptism in one form or another. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of the one who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Sisters and brothers in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit. And this is all God's gift offered to us without Christ through the reaffirmation of our faith we renew the covenant declared at our baptism, affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church, and we recognize the presence of the Holy Spirit now at work in our lives. Since earliest times, the vows of Christian baptism have consisted first of the renunciation of all that is evil, and then the profession of faith and loyalty to the church. In this time right now, we will affirm these vows that were made at our baptism. We gather here today of the body of Christ, the church. As such, I, I ask you to reaffirm your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ. Dear friends, do you reject all that is evil in the world? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. I do. Do you desire to serve Christ in his church and to acknowledge publicly the good news of the gospel and to take your place in the service of praise, to persevere in love by practicing hospitality and by visiting your brothers and sisters in the family of God? I do. Therefore, as a sign of our honor and respect to Christ, would you please stand and join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Believers in Christ, do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. You may be seated. Lord, we hear the sound of water. We're reminded of your love. We're reminded of your grace. We're reminded of how you have come into the world, how you love the world so much that you gave us your son. 
we connect with him now because he's with us. He's one with us. God with us. Even in our baptism, he is with us. And, and God, we wish to be reminded of your presence in our lives. We wish to know that forgiveness of sin one more time, this, this incredible assurance that you will always love us, always be with us be at work in us, to bring us to perfect holiness, to acts of perfect love, to be reminded of our redemption and salvation and of our union with you and the Holy Spirit and to know peace and joy. All of this are gifts that this water reminds us we are all about when we belong to Jesus. And so bless the water. Let it be a sign to us of our everlasting covenant as new creatures of God. And we pray this in your holy name. Amen. I do want to remind you that this is an act of reaffirmation for those of you that have already been baptized. Um, you don't get baptized again. You're already in the kingdom of God, but you can renew that baptism. You can reaffirm the vows that were taken. And so some of the appropriate ways we have listed that, that you may do that is to simply uh, maybe just uh, cup the water in your hand, or you can take some water and, and place it on the top of your head or make the sign of the cross on your forehead or just touch your, your head or face with the water, however you feel so led. And to hear the words, remember your baptism and be joyful. God wants us to know his joy today. I want to invite uh, Dave Teske uh, here and Nancy Mahowald here as the uh, leaders of our church, and they too will share those words of renewal with you. Hear God calling your name, friends, and at the direction of the ushers, they'll simply come to your row, and, and you're welcome to come forward as they do. If you are so led, come and receive God's gift of living water. Remember your baptism. And leave full of joy. Come, you're welcome. Renew your baptism and be joyful. Amen. Renew your baptism and be joyful. Amen. Renew your baptism, Sophia. Be joyful. Yeah, renew your baptism and be joyful. Renew your baptism and be joyful. Renew your baptism and be joyful. 
again referring to your bulletin or on screen, let us rejoice in the faithfulness of our covenant God, almighty and everlasting God, through water and the spirit, you have forgiven our sins, strengthened us and confirmed us in the faith. Send down upon us all the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and fortitude, the spirit of knowledge and of piety, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Inspire our witness and our service, for you have made us a royal priesthood, a people singled out by purchase to proclaim your magnificent words. We have been called from darkness into your wonderful light, which is Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, world without end. Amen. I invite you to stand as we close our worship. We'll sing when Jesus came to Jordan, and we'll sing verses 1 and 3. Verses 1 and 3. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship and the power of the Holy Spirit bless you and keep you now and always. Amen. Let us respond by singing. May the peace of God be with you. May the favor 